So where did it all begin? How did sound and video games first marry up? The very first video game, Space War, came out of MIT in the early 1960s. A team of computing students were given time on MIT's new compact computer, the PDP-1. And they thought about how best to use that computer power. And they thought, well, what we need is a shoot 'em up And they designed a game called Space War. That game required a machine that really only a university computing lab or a research facility had the resources to support. But that game began to propagate out and be copied between different university campuses. And it was at one university campus that Nolan Bushnell, who would later go on to found the company Atari, came across the game. He loved it. He could see some commercial potential in it, but realised that it was never going to fly while it was tied to one of these mainframe computers. So he spent the next five or ten years trying to simplify the components enough to be able to build them into a cabinet, put in place a coin-op mechanism, and release it as a commercial venture. Now, ultimately, that led to Pong. Now, Pong wasn't the first video game, and it wasn't the first video game with sound, but it was the first video game that really captured the public consciousness. Now, of the sound, Alan Alcorn, who designed it, was instructed by Nolan and his business partner, Ted Dabney, to create sounds that recreated the sound of a crowd roaring every time you won a point and a boo and a hiss whenever you lost one. The problem was, Alcorn didn't know how to create any of those sounds and in any case, he was running out of parts on the circuit board. So what he did was he poked around in the sync generator on the hardware and found a bunch of square wave tones in there. So the sounds of Pong were really the sounds that were already in the machine. It was sound design by default rather than by design. But the success of Pong essentially defined the sound of video games from that point on. It was my first experience of, of computer-generated sound with the SID chip, and uh, I completely fell in love with it. Maybe there's an opening for just specialising in doing the music. So that's when everything came together and I made my first sound driver, or sound program, if you will, and, um, and created music for this game. And that's how the whole thing got started. He only did a couple of Big 20 things, and then we kind of went on to the 64, really, which was oh, indeed, uh, obviously, the SID chip. Oh. Just one day, one of the guys from the computer club, he, he got my phone number. I was, uh, I would have been 15 at this, top, this point, and he phoned up and he said, uh, do you want to do the music for Last Ninja 2? So I said, yeah. Even as a 10-year-old, I was as much a music geek as I was a computer geek. I'd read an, an article in a, a magazine or a newspaper somewhere back in 1983 about the Yamaha DX7 synthesizer and the Casio CZ101. And I knew right from the outset that music technology was in my blood. And my first computer then was a 48K ZX Spectrum, which had just a single channel beeper speaker. So although it was great to play games on, the musical experience was really not all that good. And the Commodore, with its sound interface device, or the SID chip as it's affectionately known, really bundled up a hardware synthesizer inside a home computer. And I knew then that that was a computer that I just had to get my hands on. The interest's always been there. Uh, hence the SID t-shirt, I don't know if you can see that. And this is how dedicated we are to the SID chip. We have a tattoo of the 6581 on the arm. <laughs> People keep saying to me, why have you got a harmonica tattooed on your arm? It's a SID chip, dear. If you look at earlier games, maybe something like David Whittaker's Lazy Jones, the soundtrack 
is still innovative. The, the soundtrack in Lazy Jones adapts and evolves in response to the player. In the game, you play a feckless hotel caretaker who has to move between 18 rooms playing different mini games in each. Now, each room has its own little musical sting and the music seamlessly segues and transitions between them as you move between different areas of the game. But the music itself is actually pretty simple. David Whittaker really just used the SID chip as a simple tone generator. And so the music when you break it down is just a two channel track with the third SID channel being reserved for sound effects. There's a melody line that plays a catchy melody and then a bass line that plays the root in broken octaves. Now, that idea was already kind of part of the staple of the British synth pop and new romantic sound of the 1980s. Think about New Order's Blue Monday, for example. And the reason that that gets introduced is because if you don't introduce movement in the music, what you end up with is quite a dry, sterile sounding synth track. And so one of the tricks that early adopters of the SID realised was to make the music engaging, you had to keep it moving. It had to be on the move somewhere all the time. And so you have these really dynamic, catchy tunes. But I think where the SID really came into its own was when you had composers like Rob Hubbard, who began to work not just within the constraints of the SID chip, but actually started to write music both for and with the SID chip in mind. So they were composing specifically for the SID as an instrument. And actually, that began to change the way that composers actually thought about music itself. So Rob Hubbard, for example, started to think about music procedurally. So rather than think about music as just a linear sequence of notes that plays from start through to finish, what Rob started to think about was how he could abstract and nest different levels of musical detail. And so he would have little fragments of music that he could encode and then replay and modulate or reverse or transpose. And so he could very, very efficiently package up all of the music from uh, a composition down into just a few bytes of code. Now again, that was absolutely fundamental to the art of game composition because the game music had to sit alongside all of the other game code and the graphics and the gameplay. And very often the game composers would only have maybe five or six kilobytes of the Commodore's 64K of memory to play with. Now today, if you think about uh, an audio recording, CD audio quality uses about 10 megabytes of storage space for every minute of recorded audio. Now that was a phenomenal luxury back then. You know, back in the 1980s, RAM memory was phenomenally expensive. It cost tens of thousands of dollars per megabyte. So 64K was already quite a lot of space, but nowhere near enough to encode the sort of linear digital audio that we're now used to. And so part of the innovative thinking that composers like Rob Hubbard and others came up with was a way to kind of condense their musical ideas down and encode them in a way that could be diluted and, and replayed later in real time by the SID chip. Quite a lot of artists picked up the SID station, like Daft Punk used it to score a movie called Irreversible. Uh, KMFDM used it for tracks, Zombination was an avid user, Prodigy used it as well, so it, it met a lot of people um, and kind of became like a sort of cult hit. Uh, and of course, uh, a few years later, it also became very popular in the chiptune uh, scene. And uh, there, of course, a lot of people used it uh, instead of using a tracker or or editor for C64, and uh, yeah, it became very popular there as well. I saved up for the best part of a year and a half, all of my pocket money, and it was meager. But I think my parents saw just how committed I was to the machine, uh, and eventually they acquiesced. I managed to augment my meager savings, and we went out and bought a second-hand Commodore 64. For Infamously, there are four 
revisions of the original 658 one Sid sound chip and ones that maybe myself as a more of a purist prefer. So when I got the Commodore, uh, I, I couldn't wait to get it hooked up, uh, rigged up to the television set. And the thing that I was anticipating most was actually loading up a game called Hypersports. Now, I think in the summer of 1984, I probably pumped all of my pocket money into a Hypersports coin-op machine in a holiday park in Millport on the west of Scotland. I loved that game. And I'd played it on the Commodore 64 before. The thing that I really wanted to experience, though, was Martin Galway's music and that interminable 15 minute wait while you waited for the game to load from tape was worth it because when I finally heard the music coming through my television speakers it was a cover version of Vangelis's Chariots of Fire. It sounded to my ears every bit as produced and every bit as clear and clean as the original track. I couldn't believe that it was being generated in real time and coming through that grey plastic beige hunk of loveliness that the that the Commodore 64 was. I had a ZX81 to start off with, uh, then a ZX Spectrum, uh, but there were a friend of mine down the road that had a uh, Commodore 64. We were a bit of a hi-fi buff actually, got it wired up to his uh, up to his stereo, so I went down one day and it blew me away. I can't remember exactly what game he got on now, I think it might, might, have, been, uh, might have been Frantic Freddy or something like that, but he got it wired up to his stereo and uh, it kind of blew me away I'd never heard anything like it before I couldn't believe it was actually coming out of a computer so I had to do a bit more research on that and find out what exactly the sound chip did etc so but after that I needed one so I pestered my parents so I think it was Christmas 1985 I managed to get older one later on after possibly the first or second revision of the C64C um, they decided to use the, the 8580 SID chip now the 858 has got a couple of disadvantages, one of which that it doesn't play sampled sounds at all well. Sampled sounds were basically fiddling, originally fiddling the volume register till something sounded um, coherent enough to be a sampled sound. This obviously technique improved over time, but even so, when you had that kind of routine to play a sampled sound, you were still doing the same thing, but just in a more enhanced way. But the 858 said chip just didn't like it half the time. And even between the 6581s and even between the same model of SID chip, the thing that the music programmers had to really struggle with was the filter variation. On a 6581, you've got as much as 20% filter variation. So if you're writing something and it sounds really cool and heavily filtered and it sounds awesome, you play on another 64 with a SID chip and it sounds terrible. And I know that having spoken to Martin Galway about this, um, he was planning in certain games, certainly I think Terra Cresta um, was one of them, where they were going to basically have a tuning parameter so you could basically f um, alter parts of the music code so that you'd basically have the um, sound sounding right on different variations okay. of the SID model. I mean, ironically, sort of the game I was talking about that I sort of first launched my Oracle reviews with, mm. International 3D Tennis, that actually had a, uh, a filter yeah. uh, uh, option in the, uh, in the options menu for the game. So, you know, difficulty, number of players, and then you could actually test the filter. Uh, that it actually enabled you to uh, fiddle around with a couple of parameters. So it actually sounded, you know, vaguely plausible yeah. on your own machine so a few games did have them in but unfortunately they were few and far between uh, video games manufacturers wrote loader music and sometimes had little games that you could play while you waited you know there was a a, a system called uh invader load which on some mastertronic titles booted up uh, a game of space invaders uh, which you could then play while the rest of the game came in. And in some cases, that little game of Space Invaders was better than the actual game that, that, that you were loading up to play. But, you know, it didn't matter because you had a chunk of Rob Hubbard music in the background, a game of Space Invaders, and all for £1.99. Um, when you were growing up, you were listening to the likes of Rob Hubbard, Martin Galway, Fred Gray, Matt Gray, Jerome Tell, Ben Dalglish. I could go on with a huge list of people who were clearly ahead of their time at that time writing superb pieces. I knew I could never be as good as them, but it was always about 
writing something that people would enjoy listening to and thinking actually that was quite a good soundtrack and, and actually sort of enjoying it. Um, I remember as well there were other little independent um, programmers who got in touch with me and said well would you like to do the music for a couple of games. I ended up doing um, two or three of Frank Gaskin's um, music for the, for, for the game. So I think Billion, which is one of Commodore's own, ended up and doing the music for that. There's some other ones that Commodore's own for publishing as part of their cover mount and they, I got the music um, done for those as well. So it's quite nice to sort of give something back. So I think there's a wave of uh, Sid musicians. I mean, I, I was, I sort of got going as Rob was sort of got, going off to the States. So you obviously had Rob and Martin Galway and David Whittaker and Ben Daglish been going for a while. And then, so I was probably part of the next wave. I don't know how else would have been around with me. Probably Maniacs and Noise as well. After that, it was not. And then it was obviously the the whole scene went on for many years afterwards. I think the careers advisor at school said I should be a chemical engineer. So that didn't work out very well, did it? I used to play games a lot on the Commodore 64, but as soon as I started to hear the likes of Rob Hubbard and Ben Douglas's music on. Monty on the Run and Cobra and International Karate. I wanted to try and recreate some of those sounds myself. Now, Commodore's Basic gave you access to all of the capabilities of the, the sound interface device or the SID chip, but Commodore really didn't make it easy for end users to code their own music. They didn't have any music specific commands in Basic, and so if you wanted to make music, you had to really do quite a deep dive into the, the Commodore's memory registers, ideas that are maybe a, more in common with machine code programming than they are with BASIC. There weren't very many music tools at the time. So really, to be a musician on the Commodore, you had to be part programmer, part technician, and part creative. It was a, a really exciting time. The, um, uh, the thing that the programmers liked what was really attractive to all the developers and the programmers was the fact that um, what I was doing was the complete package. So they didn't have to worry about any of the code. The integration was like really, really straightforward. They just told me where, they, where to assemble the code in memory. And um, I would do that and then hand off the, the um, I didn't give them the source code, I gave them the, the binary file. For them to load in and told them how you know uh, how to uh, what, what the entry points were to, to, to do it but that's that's the thing that they really liked about it was the fact that i was you know handling all the code side of it they didn't have to worry about any of that stuff i had a lot of downtime and i used that to uh, do research on the commodore 64 what could i do sound you know, with the, te with the technology to get more out of the sound chip. And one of the things that I developed was uh, sampling, sa samples. So I got together with a friend and we built a little um, hardware sampler and, um, and sampled drums and other sounds into the Commodore 64 with my own software again and then played it back. And um, the, the way I found out about it was I listened to a a program called Digi Drums, which had like was like a little drum machine with digitized samples. And the interesting thing was, I took that apart and and looked at it, and I realized you can play the the sit voices, the three voices, while the sampling plays over it. And that was a revelation. And they did it with the volume register. It had like 16 steps, basically like a four bit sample and um and you could play drums and other sounds as long as they would like end up at like level eight you know center line you would hear the the sit sample the sit sounds in the background and that i put that together and i created some cool tunes uh, for the projects at rainbow arts and um was essentially like really waiting for the day they were released because I had this stuff laying around for months and then someday somebody comes into the office and plays Arcanoid, Martin Galway, you know, and it had something like that, like the samples. 
And I was like, holy moly, somebody else figured it out and released something before me. So, uh, but anyway, um, that's just like a little side story. But I did a bunch of um, projects with the samples. One was uh, Bad Cat, a dreadful game, but it had good music. And uh, Jinx was another one. And then the big success was the Great Jana Sisters. The sampling on 360, C64, I'm not sure what the first game was, but um, th there was a real awful sample that was used on Ghostbusters. So it became apparent that you could do samples. And um, I think I worked with Simon Nickel about, um, you know, about getting a, a sample routine uh, playback happening, um, which really wasn't that um, wasn't that difficult. Um, the piece of code is just really, really small to get to get the samples going. But what I wanted to do was uh, try to find a way to get the be able to play a sample, not just a, a little speech sample with nothing else going on, but to get a musical, get something integrated in the music. So distorted rock guitar was an obvious choice because of the fact you've only got four bit samples playing at a resolution of about, you know, uh, six kilohertz or something. And um, the uh, thing is, the, to get the samples going, you, you have to use a four bit volume register and that tends to muck up the, all the rest of the synth sounds. So then it becomes just a, a real ball ache, well it was a ball ache, to try to, you know, um, find the, you know, the right kind of SID parameters that would work with the sample and, get, and try to make it sound like it was integrated. I was a big fan of Crash and Zap magazine. Um, there was something really nice about the rivalry between the two platforms and, and that, that kind of friendly platform-based rivalry came out in, in, the, in the writing. Um, the thing I loved about Zap were the personalities, you know, that actually they, when they were doing reviews and, and features, they focused on the music uh, quite a lot. I remember in particular Gary Penn talking about uh, Martin Galway's music from Hypersports and, and saying how Commodore 64 music had really reached a new height. And I think that encouraged me a bit more to try and explore music making on the Commodore. But I looked then to, to books. That, I mean, the Commodore manual had a, a, a section on programming. There was a little basic program that you could type in at the back uh, that gave you some numbers and showed you how to do different effects, filter sweeps and pitch glides and uh, basic melodies and things like that. But I went out and bought, again, with my hard-saved pocket money, um, a few introductory guides on graphic and sound programming. And that was really how I got started. It was typing in other people's programs and then adapting the data sections of those programs to begin to, to make my own music. And initially, I started off like loads of kids do in music shops with Scott Joplin's Entertainer. I loved Ragtime uh, and I loved that the Commodore gave you enough leeway to kind of convincingly recreate Ragtime music. And, and even then there were a few games, uh, you know, Rob Hubbard's Action Biker soundtrack has a, a really kind of raggy quality and so too does Martin Galway's soundtrack to Kong Strikes Back. And the Sid then gave me a way of exploring that style of music because back then, my piano chops weren't quite as good as they are now. And, and I found stretch chords and, and, and things like that. The syncopation of ragtime really difficult to get under my fingers. And the, the Commodore was a way then of using technology to compensate for my developing playing technique and exploring the music in a bit more depth. Robin Hogg at the time of Zap had said to me, um, are you able to maybe look at sort of hacking music or maybe just making it so that with a few reset switch buttons you can sort of um, get something to play the music out? So I'll give it a go, see what happens. And over time there were several music listings published where basically you could sort of reset the game, type in a listing, um, add a couple of data lines and it would play the music by certain composers because most composers even though they may not have written their own um, compiler player the player when compiled would normally be similar 
so you'd have an idea of how their code works and how their structures worked and also how they would store the music data to play the tune as well. So you had a rough idea of how that would how that would play out and how that would work. It wasn't a case of this was a dream that I wanted to do. You know, it was never a case of I thought, well, this is what this is really what I want to do. It was something that came along and you know, basically I got into doing it. And um, originally it was to pay the rent, you know, because musicians don't really earn very much. And um, it kind of just really, really took off. And um, uh, I got, got absorbed in the culture of it and basically went with the flow. It's a station, uh, I've got five 64s with MIDI interfaces. I've got the modular synth, that weird big box, that's mine, which has got, that's got the Commodore 64 oscillators in it. Um, I've got a Messiah, uh, and I've got a MIDI NES as well, which is a, it's a, it's a NES cartridge that plugs in that you can then connect to a MIDI interface and play the sound chip through Cubase or whatever. You know, a lot of the guys in the demo scene used to call, the, you know, because I had my telephone number on my early uh, mail out list, you know, a lot of people in the demo scene would call me up at three o'clock in the morning and stuff like that, wouldn't they? Sometimes they'd show up at the door, you know. <laughs> Hi, Rob, come to see you. You know, yeah. suddenly show up at the doorstep. Mm. All the way from Germany. Or North you know, North yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, didn't actually get into composing on it until quite late on. Uh, I think Chris Allsbeck came up with a, a utility called Sound Monitor. Uh, so I decided to have a dabble with that and see if I could actually produce any music with it. Uh, didn't do bad. Because the SID chip was ahead of its time, it was three channels of analog, but it was really well done. You could have lots of um, really nice instrumentation. You could do all things with filters. Um, you could really make it analog sound sound really lovely. Uh, okay, so you can do this stuff, and can do this stuff, and then, and so we, we thought, okay, well, we're going to beat this because that's how sort of geeks worked at the time, you know. I hear that and I'm going to improve on it. So we then, um, well, Tony went and, and, and rewrote his player with kind of suggestions from me as to little things that we could do, routines we could do, you know. Uh, and uh, so, yes, he, um, over the next six months a year or something we kind of evolved our player to be able to do use all the tricks that the, 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 the SID chip was, was, was um, capable of. If you think about it we were essentially pioneers of this era and discovering all this stuff on the Commodore 64 and the Amiga and other machines um, it was really like this discovery of new capabilities and creating our own software for it and stuff like that. That was really something special for us. I mean, if you wanted to play a chord, you could either use all three channels, yeah. but it's a bit limiting. You're just going to play a chord pattern. So, yeah, what, what everyone was sort of using was this method of um, rotating between the, the notes. And I used to have a... Uh, what we call a plex routine, so you're, you're plexing the notes together to to form a chord or the impression of a chord. The notes going between very quickly, uh, and depending on what else you did with the waveform, if it was a pulse waveform, you could you know sweep the pulse and it, it would smooth over the edges on it. But you could go between two, three, four, any number of notes you wanted, you know. Um, and I just had lookup tables for. The chords, you know, if I if I wanted a third and a fifth on the root note, then I'd have one for that, and I'd have one for a minor chord and a major chord. Um, other times, you could use it in all sorts of interesting ways. You could just, I even had a routine to plex between different waveforms, so you get all sorts of strange effects. Um, they would literally, if you wanted to sort of push the boundaries of it, you had to think of a new routine to do. You know, one of the popular things was to give the effect of a constant hi-hat you'd put a little bit of white noise just before the bass so you'd switch to that hi-hat and it'd give the effect of having a, a, a hi-hat before each bass note. I've been playing in a band for 14 years now uh, called Sid 80s or Stuck in the 80s and uh, we were formed back in 2003 uh, for a gig down in Brighton called Back in Time which was basically uh, a Commodore 64 geek fest to, to be fair. Um, a lot of the uh, old composers and 
game coders and artists all came down there, plus a load of fans of the machine. And uh, this band was formed from uh, fans of the Commodore 64, from uh, composers who worked on the, on the Commodore 64 back in the day. And uh, our, our aim was to have a lot of fun and to play some up, updated rock covers of some of these Commodore 64 games. A lot of people won't realise that um, some, of the game, some of the tunes that were written for this limited three-channel analogue synthesiser in the Commodore 64, the original idea was for the piece of music to be played by a band. So in some ways we're basically reinventing uh, the ideas of the original composer and the, the thoughts that he had in his head of where that music was going to go um, to start off with in the first place. Um, uh, it's a lot of fun, we don't do it that often um, and we get a day's rehearsal maybe with a couple of years of not playing together and we just have a lot of fun and it, somehow it kind of works. Well, Mark particularly, Mark is superb violinist. I, I would rate Mark as against any other electric fiddler in the country, you know. But I mean, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I can play, but I'm not kind of really, 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 really. But uh, um, we kind of, yeah, we, we, we pull it off with a bit of chutzpah and a bit of kind of, because we know the stuff and we've arranged it ourselves and stuff. But uh, um, some of the boys out there, I mean, press play on tape. You know, whenever I've, I've, I've played with them a couple of times and, and you know, seen them a lot, and, and yeah, I mean, they, they actually do all the bloody notes. Uh, and again, and fast loaders as well, of course. I mean, we, we did the, the, the last Ninja thing down in Camden um, uh, last year where um, uh, Jarl Olsen was playing all the notes in the last Ninja that I'd written for, again, I was writing all these wild arpeggios that you'd never dream that any human would ever. <laughs> He's doing the double finger tapping and he's every single bloody note, man. Out of this world, yeah. No, I mean, there are some seriously dedicated boys out there who are kind of making sure that they get in every single note, you know. But um, for us, we kind of, it's more of a broad brush thing. The tune vaguely sounded like this, so we'll play it vaguely like that, you know. But as we wrote it, we can change what the hell we like. So let's just miss off that really hard solo because none of us can do it. So somewhere around the back of Asda, I had the idea for back in time live which was uh, taking a big dance club and um, filling it with Commodore 64 fans in the end it got about 5% filled with Commodore 64 fans a lot of empty space and a load of VIPs in the VIP room because it like Tony Crowther, Ben Daglish, Richard Joseph, Martin Galway, David Whittaker and uh, everyone in the VIP room had a lot better time than the people in the club um, that club is actually a Spearmint Rhino now um, it was Club DNA and the next year we went grungy in Soho um, uh, with uh, the heavy metal band Machine Supremacy and press play on tape 2003 Brighton Centre, 2004 St Luke's in a church uh, 2005 uh, dodgy pub in Manchester etc etc um, and all the while CDs were being released uh, because people were coming to me with their CD ideas I'd done three or four um, and people were coming to me with CD ideas and saying oh can you release this please like Ryan Hourhand and Instant Remedy and the Remix, Remix 64 crew and and uh, I was quite happy to do that because I, I wasn't hung up on just promoting my own music but in bringing making things possible for Commodore 64 fans and, uh, if they had a dream of a CD of dance music who was I to stand in their way if I could make it happen my mindset has I've been I've always been very very kind of pretty much obsessed with music at the expense of just about everything else and I still am in a lot of ways you know I still you know practice instruments and still um, I still write a few things as well, and um, so I suppose if I hadn't done it, I would, I would, have, I would have drifted into something else. Uh, I managed to get in touch with Rob Hubbard and talk him into working with me on a, an official studio CD of Commodore 64 tunes, which everyone had been asking for but no one had done. Um, and I kind of stepped up to the plate because no one else was going to do it. Some people had been talking about it, but they'd never done it. And that was back in time, and that was released in 1998. Chris Abbott and I have been talking about maybe, you know, trying to get together and do an orchestral, you know, concert of some of the some of that stuff. 
some of it's suitable and some of it's not really that suitable and um, I've been working on some orchestral scores for that using Sibelius which uh, is really a fantastic program um, and you know who knows if this is ever going to happen some you know people talk about a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff never does happen but if it, you know if it does happen it would be kind of cool Commodore 64 music was such a big thing it, it's hard to hard to overstate how important it was even in Zap 64 which is the biggest magazine at the time there was a readers music chart for, for the game music it was it was not really anything that happened before there was something about the Commodore 64 sound that it was of the time and pop music was all synthesizers and there was this computer that could create synthesized music that sounded like what you were hearing in the charts and it had its own unique characteristic and in the transition to the Amiga, the Amiga didn't have any of the, the synthesis, it just had sample playback. And when I did my first game, it was a conversion from the Commodore 64 to the Amiga, so what I wanted to do was make it sound like the Commodore 64. So I checked all of the available options, and I, uh, I tried to use a program called Future Composer, because it could emulate some of the Commodore 64 sounds. Um, but at the end of the day, that didn't really work out, so I had to do remixes. and. Initially, it, w it was very restricting because the Commodore 64 sound chip, it was, it, was, it was a decade ahead of everything else. So even to the stage of where the Amiga came out, the Amiga couldn't do the sounds that the Commodore 64 was doing. It was that good. So yeah, we, we tried to emulate initially what the Commodore 64 was doing, and then eventually we found ways to use samples more creatively and do more interesting sounds on the Amiga itself using its capabilities instead. So I think it was probably about 1986 or 1987 that I started to see magazine articles. I remember one in Zap 64 that talked about the Amiga as being this graphical powerhouse, so a machine that could do thousands of colours and create broadcast quality graphics. And that piqued my interest. But the thing that really convinced me that I had to have one were two demos, two bits of public domain software that came along. The first was an animation. Somebody had done a stop frame animation of the Imperial Walker from Star Wars. And when I saw it, I was blown away. I couldn't believe that a home computer was capable of creating something that looked so visually stunning. And then the second was a demo that just played back snaps. I got the power. But again, I couldn't believe my ears. I couldn't believe that there was a machine that was capable of producing music that sounded like production music. And at that point then, I knew where my future lay. And the Commodore 64's days, sadly, were numbered. Yeah, actually, when I finally moved over to the Amiga, it was really like a, a opening up of, of possibilities because the Amiga has uh, four sample channels, so it could play like um, drums and voices and and any type of instrument. You can sample into it. You can kind of reproduce, and that was very freeing. And you could even like. Uh, sample in chords, so you could enhance the capabilities of those four channels by by playing a sample of a chord on one channel, and that would already sound like three channels essentially. Things like that. So I did not try to emulate the SID chip much on the Amiga. I really decided to use the capabilities to its full effect. And the best example there is also on the our type for the Amiga, I did a completely different title music, uh, which was more cinematic, had a more cinematic character. From that point on, I was absolutely hooked. The Amiga delivered gameplay and graphics and music in spades. It was big, it was chunky, it had a form factor that looked like a, a Commodore 128 on steroids with a television modulator hanging off the back. But although it was a little unwieldy, there was just something about it that was sleek and tactile and chunky. And that matched the, the depth and the quality of the graphics and the sound that it offered. The Soundtracker presented music a bit like a musical spreadsheet. 
All of the musical patterns were arranged in a grid with four channels arranged vertically, each corresponding to one of the Amiga's sample channels. Now, because the Amiga was sample-based rather than synthesis-based, it also meant that you could bring in real-world sound recordings, bass guitars, guitars, drum kits, pianos, synths, Hammond organs. And so the Amiga could sound like a rock band, or it could sound like an orchestra. And all of a sudden, that combination of possibility and an accessible interface just opened up creative music making on home computers. Next generation after the sound monitor was uh, TFMX, which was an idea I had um, while I was actually doing music with the sound monitor. I always felt like, oh, now I'm limited to that sound set that I developed. You know, like um, it, had a, it had a certain set of parameters for what the sound should be, and that was it. And then within that, you could like um, change the envelopes or the speed of like um, pulse width modulation and stuff like that. But it was limited to that set. And if you wanted to enhance it, just like I did with the sampling and stuff like that, um, you had to go back into programming and change the driver and then it would like break compatibility and stuff like that. So I thought like, okay, what could be the next generation of editor that I would like to have? And that was how I came up with TFMX. Um, and I called it TFMX, it was like the, I had a, the final music player and then I extended it, so it was the final music player extended. Little did I know it wasn't the final one, but it was that next level. And the idea was, instead of like having a fixed set of parameters, I would develop a little type of scripting language that would be uh, fired off each time you, um, you would uh, have a note played. So that would like run a little script, um, very simple programming language with very simple commands, but it had like um, commands to change things on the sound chip. It had some um, commands like looping or breaking out of a loop on certain events and stuff like that. And so you could build little, um, yeah, like sequences of changes to the sound and that would be triggered with each note you play. There's another guy that made um, the special amplifier that takes the stereo output of the Amiga and actually mixes it. So when you have a mod file, it's not just like left channel only, right channel only, it actually mixes it. It makes it much more pleasant to listen to. So it's just been like a lot of uh, innovation based out of necessity, especially since you know, Commodore is long gone. Uh, it, it goes into the hands of the users to, to create the new stuff. And uh, it's, it's amazing what people are doing. It almost looks like an Amiga. <laughs> It's on the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice and possible, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Did the wine get out of the shoe? 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 Did the wine things that got me really into tracking on the Amiga is that I wanted to play. Uh, I set up a band with some of my friends from school, but together we were pretty rubbish. Uh, you know, between us, we could only really string a few chords together. 
And that was never going to fly on the club circuit or, or anything else. So I used my Amiga as a backing band. I used to sit and track rock tracks and metal tracks and jazz tracks and blues tracks. And I would then take those back into my, my home studio, which was really just my mum and dad's dining room with a piano and a couple of keyboards at the back end of it. And I would sit and jam along to my Amiga tracked backing tracks. Over time, I decided that where I wanted to go with my career was video game development. I really, really wanted to be a video game composer. And I was using then the Amiga and soundtracking as a way of developing my compositional chops, if you like. Um, in 1997, Scottish Enterprise and at the time something called the Scottish Games Alliance launched a UK-wide competition to find the best amateur video game talent. Now I entered under the music category and won. I, I, I wrote a soundtrack for a a fictional game called The Chase, which was loosely based on Chase HQ, but featured a kind of Parliament-style, funky 70s cop show soundtrack. Imagine Starsky and Hutch on speed, and you'd be roughly in the right kind of lines. Now, I won the music category, and, and off the back of that, started to get a few freelance commissions. I worked with uh, a couple of small and, and fairly moderate sized companies on some PlayStation tracks and uh, some Amiga games. But it was when I was at the, the award ceremony for that competition that I met two guys, John Sutherland and, and Ian Marshall, who had just launched the world's first master's programme in video games technology at Aberdeen University. Now they were just in the process of launching an undergraduate degree program and a sister program in computer arts. And they saw something they liked in me and convinced me then to surrender all of my commercial hopes and ambitions and become an academic. And really, uh, that's the path I've been following ever since. There's always been a big part of my working life, certainly over the last uh, 10 years or so. Well, since 1999, Dungeon Keeper 2 was my last full-on musical project um, until I picked it up again a few years back. Um, and I've always had a passion for motorsport, specifically Formula One, to be fair. And uh, some of the work that I've been doing, as, as well as uh, on the computer game front, uh, we've had a couple of um, agreements with a number of teams where they would allow us to record their cars on track uh, to be used in the games uh, with the agreement that uh, those recordings would also be used in their simulators, which is what the drivers use to, to train and practice before uh, they're, they're racing any particular circuit. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite lucky, really, that uh, I've been able to work with some of these Formula One teams to get their sound of their simulators closer to what uh, the video games sound like. There's still a lot of work to be done, um, but uh, it's, it's quite gratifying for a, for a F1 petrol head like me to, to have my arms stuck up the nose cone of a Formula One car and have access to the, the, these things that, uh, that normal people just don't get to see. Skate or Die, they loved it over in California. They were, they were blown away by it and offered me a job straight away, you know. And um, said, do you want to work in England or California? So it took me about half a second to decide where I wanted to live, you know. I was really keen to go out there, but it, I mean, it wasn't just it wasn't just that. It was because when I'd been there before, I'd seen this whole kind of, you know, R.J. Michael, entrepreneurial Silicon Valley. You know, um, I'd seen that whole vibe of what they were thinking and what they were doing. It's all the it's all the nine ten year old kids who are now hitting 40 and they've got money in their pockets and their wives are saying to them, go out with your friends and go and do some gaming or whatever, leave me alone. Uh, and uh, so they're all coming to events like this and they're all, uh, indeed, indeed, I, you know, so I'm, I'm attending, yes, one of these, uh, you know, or a, an event every six months or something and uh, 
Um, no, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big scene and it's, a, uh, it's great because it is. It's reminding people about their childhood and all the rest of it, you know. The Amiga was important and I used it for a long time. I, I made music using my Amiga until about 2010. So I really stuck with it throughout all of its problems. So I understand the attachment to it. And I've still got a load of Amigas uh, in my mum's loft. All, the, all, all of the big ones, the 4000s and, and 3000s and so on. So yeah, I understand the attachment to it. But I never really knew anybody else who was attached to it like I was. Except for, I think there's a big thing with musicians. Musicians really love the Amiga because it was the outlet. Um, you've got Calvin Harris, um, Jay-Z started out on an Amiga because it could do samples. Uh, and it was a really big deal, so I think there is this attachment, certainly for musicians, to, to the Amiga. But seeing everybody else and the way everybody else appreciates it like I always did, it, it's so satisfying, it really is, that, that 30 years later, here's all these people who were as into it as I was. When you look back at the music of those original said composers, really what you're seeing is the said as a lens through which they reinterpreted all of the music that they listened to. So when you look at the music of Rob Hubbard and Ben Dalgleish and Martin Galway, you can see the influences of Kraftwerk and Yellow Magic Orchestra and Jean-Michel Jarre all reinterpreted and reimagined with the said as an instrument. I think when you look forward to what Czech music is today, you see the influence of rave and drum and bass and techno and garage all coming through. And kids are doing what kids have always done. They're looking back and they're picking up on the musical references that mean something to them. And they're reinventing them. I think, above all else, what things like the Sid Chip give us is a means of music making in its rawest and purest form. There's nowhere for weak arrangements to hide on the Sid Chip. It's too limited for that. And so when kids are using the said, really what they're doing is refining their technique and they're getting back to raw musical expression. And that, I think, is where the future of the said lies. It's in freeing us up from the tyranny of choice that music technology brings. We don't need to worry about whether or not the perfect preset sound is hiding in the next menu alone. It's just like Devo sang in the 1980s. Freedom of choice is what you got. Freedom from choice is what you want.